I'd like to thank everyone for coming this morning to hear our presentations. I'd also like to thank the organizers of ASH for the invitation to speak and really introduce everyone to a very exciting new therapy that, like all these other therapies, really herald the dawn of a new age for CLL patients. These new therapies really afford the opportunity to treat patients not just who have refractory disease with very effective therapies, but to treat patients much more safely than we've ever done before. So I will be presenting abstract, a phase three randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study evaluating the efficacy and safety of idelalisib and rituximab for previously treated patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Idelalisib, which is a novel small molecule inhibitor, is targeted, highly selective, and orally bioavailable, and inhibits an enzyme, the phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase delta isoform. As you can see here, that it's highly specific for the PI3 kinase delta isoform, which is present predominantly in leukocytes. The other isoforms of PI3 kinase, which are present in other cells, really have no inhibition at, and I apologize for the speaker not work, the pointer not working, uh, really has no clinical impact upon the other isoforms, alpha, beta, and gamma of the PI3 kinase enzyme. Inhibiting the PI3 kinase delta isoform leads to inhibition of proliferation and induces apoptosis to CLL cells and inhibits homing and retention of CLL cells in lymphoid tissues. So study 116 was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. In this study, patients were randomized to receive rituximab and idelalisib at 150 milligrams BID or placebo plus rituximab. The placebo was administered BID, as was the idelalisib. The rituximab was administered at 375 milligrams per meter squared week one, then 500 milligrams per meter squared every two weeks times four doses, then 500 milligrams every four weeks for three more doses, for eight doses over six months. Patients were stratified based upon 17P or P53 dysfunction, IGVH mutated versus unmutated, as well as prior anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Key eligibility criteria for the trial include patients who were relapsed refractory and considered to be unfit for receiving additional chemotherapy. This would be measured as a cumulative illness rating scale score, or a SEER score, of greater than six, creatinine clearance less than 60 cc's per minute, or other factors that really prohibited them from getting chemotherapy. The primary endpoint for this study was progression-free survival by an independent review committee. Um, other secondary events that were followed were disease progression, I'm sorry, were death and overall response rate, lymph node responses, and overall survival. As you can see here that the baseline characteristics for both study groups were very well balanced. I'd like to point out that the median number of prior therapies was three in both arms, and that the median time since diagnosis was 7.8 and 8.6 um, as well. And that the 83 and 85% of the two groups respectively had unmutated immunoglobulin mutational status, and 42 and 46% respectively for idelalisib and placebo had deletion 17P or P53 mutations. The median SEER score was eight, with a range of three to 18 for the idelalisib arm and one to 18 for the placebo arm. I'd like to call attention to the number of patients who had at least one organ system with a SEER score of greater than three, which really is indic indicative of very you know, close to um, very severe, I'm sorry, for severe impact upon activities of daily living, really indicating that this was a fairly unfit population. The median creatinine clearance was 62 and 67 in both arms, respectively. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and for the idelalisib plus rituximab, the median PFS has not been reached, whereas for the rituximab plus placebo, it was 5.5 months for a hazard ratio of 0 0.15. The pre-specified subgroup analysis in terms of progression-free survival showed that it favored idelalisib plus rituximab in all groups looked at. 
And looking here at waterfall plots of the change in lymph node size by radiographic measuring, you can see that all patients in the idelisib arm had met um, or had some decrease in lymphadenopathy with 93% crossing the 50% threshold to qualify as what would be a nodal response. Overall survival in both arms uh, favor, I'm sorry, overall survival favored the idelisib plus rituximab as compared to placebo plus rituximab with a hazard ratio of 0 0.28. Median overall survival had, has not been reached in either group. Adverse events were similar in both arms, uh, in particular with greater than grade three AEs being similar in both arms as well. AEs leading to drug discontinuation, which is certainly, I think, an important marker of tolerability, showed that it was 8.2% in the idelisib arm and 10.3% in the placebo arm. Total deaths on study were four patients on the idelisib arm and 12 on the placebo arm. Common AEs were similar in both groups with one interesting exception of infusion-related reactions being much higher in the placebo plus rituximab arm as compared to the idelisib plus rituxan arm. So in summary, idelisib is a targeted, highly selective, orally administered inhibitor of the delta isoform of the PI3 kinase enzyme. Patients who are heavily pretreated and are not suitable for cytotoxic chemotherapy and were at high risk of a poor outcome, demonstrated that they had an improved progression-free survival with idelisib as compared to placebo in combination with rituxan, that they also had an improved overall response rate with idelisib compared to placebo in combination with rituximab, and that the idelisib plus rituximab had an improved overall survival compared to placebo plus rituximab. Idelisib plus rituxan demonstrated a very acceptable safety profile, and it provided effective durable disease control and improved overall survival with patients with relapsed CLL who are not suited for chemotherapy. Thank you.